Romans chapter 14, verse 4. Romans 14, verse 4. The first question here, and my question is, is explain Romans 14, verse 4. And again, it's an interesting portion of Scripture, and it's one that I, don't, I think it's hard for people to understand that sometimes people can, Christians can disagree on something. Now again, we're not talking about sin. We're not talking about basic things that are wrong. We should agree on all those things. There are a lot of things we need to agree on, but there are some things we can look at differently and see differently. And that's what's talking about here, the context of Romans 14, verse 4. Here's the question. It says, please explain Romans 14, 4 about judging another man's servant. To understand that, first of all, we are accountable mainly to the Lord himself. We'll stand before the judgment seat, not as sinners, but as uh, Christians. We'll be judged not for our sin, but for our service. So the Christian judgment is a lot, a lot different than that. Romans 14, 4 says this. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? So he's bringing up a point here that they're doing something wrong here. He's kind of saying it in a sense, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are to go around judging other people's servants? Then it says, to his own master he standeth there falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up for God. And he, I'm sorry. Yea, he shall be holden up. For God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. And some things there can't, people can't, Christians, Christians can't come to different conclusions about something, not sinful things, not obvious things, not biblical things, but some of these things, some of these issues, there can't be a different thought on because they're looking at it differently than you might look on a certain thing. So in their mind, they're doing right. There's nothing wrong with what they're doing. In your mind, if you would do the same thing, you would feel it was wrong. You'd feel like you're doing wrong. That's what makes it so difficult, such a difficult subject. And I went through a whole list about, what, 35, 40 different things uh, over the years. I have my list. I keep, I keep adding to my list, too. The things that Christians can disagree on, but neither of them be wrong. See, it's not interesting. Christians can see things differently and come to a different conclusion, but neither of them are wrong. They're both right, even though they disagree. They're both right, even though they disagree. That's a strange thing, isn't it? That's a strange thing. You have to have be a kind of mature Christian to understand that. And you have to have a peace about that matter. Because some things are, like I say, some people see things differently than another Christian sees things. Okay, next question. Next question really was just three Bible verses. But when I look at these three Bible verses, I kind of understood what they were getting at. The first Bible verse is Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse number 4. Some of you already know what this is all about. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 4 to 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Now again, all I have on the questions is a not written question form. It just has three references. Hebrews 6, 4 to 6, 1 Peter 4, 18, and 2 Peter 2, 20 to 21. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 to 6 deals with this issue about uh, if a person is saved or not, how much they can look like a Christian, but not really be one. That's what they're dealing with. How close a person can look like a Christian, they can act like a Christian, they can talk like a Christian, but until they're really born again, changed by the Spirit of God with that new nature, they're not really, but how close a person can get to that place, how much they can look like a Christian, but not really be a Christian. Hebrews chapter 6, again, verse 4 now. For it is impossible, Paul, uh, the writer of Hebrews says, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. For a person to get saved, they have to be enlightened. They have to understand some things. And have tasted of the heavenly gift. They just tasted it. They didn't, so to speak, swallow it. They tasted of the heavenly gift. And were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. In other words, they heard things. They were convicted about the Holy Ghost. They, they read the Bible. Bible. The Bible itself was really inspired to be written by the God, the Holy Spirit. So every time you pick up the Bible, you're reading something the Holy Spirit is, has written, inspired men to write. 
but to partake of the Holy Ghost and have tasted of the good word of God, taste it again, not swallowed, just taste it, and the powers of the world to come, if, that's always a big little word, our big word is that big little word, if, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance. Now what, what does it mean, if they should fall away? We have to go back to verse number four at the beginning. Yeah. For it's impossible. Yeah, good. Now let's jump down to verse number six. For it's impossible if they shall fall away to redo, renew them again unto repentance. Seeing they crucified themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open chain. Put the Lord to an open chain because he wasn't able to keep those that came to him if they really did get saved. So if it brings the thought out here how close a person can get to really being saved. They can taste of the whole heavenly gift and all these different things in those verses, but not really be saved. That's a curiosity. That's a strange thing. That's such a difficult thing. After I've been saved now, you know, I've been uh, getting, well, 52, over 52 years. That's half a century. Half a century I've been saved. Uh, saved all those years. I've seen a lot. And I've seen people like this. I don't like it. It's, it. it's sad to me. But there are people like this. For a while they seem on, even on fire for the Lord, as we would say. But then they drift away and they stay away. The second verse, 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4 also deals with this subject. The idea of how a person can look like a Christian and act like a Christian for, for a while. Maybe even years, a few years. But then they drift away. And it shows they weren't really saved to begin with. That's the evidence. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 18. It says, And if the righteous scarcely be saved, scarcely be saved, uh, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? The word scarcely here in verse 18. Let me give you a cross reference. Don't lose 1 Peter, but turn to Acts chapter 14, verse 18. What does it mean scarcely? Scarcely be saved. Uh, are, they, are they saved or are they not saved? Scarcely be saved. Now, it's not talking about that in particular, but Acts chapter 14 uses the same word so we can understand this. So we understand the meaning and the application of this word. Acts chapter 14, verse number 18. <clears throat> and these, Acts 14, 18 says, and with these saying, scarce, now there's our word, scarce, scarce. And with these saying, scarce restrained they the people. What does that mean? They barely restrained the people. They, they almost didn't make it. But they did. But very, very uh, uh, slow, uh, scarcely. Almost didn't make it. That's how bad. Now that's the word scarce there. And with these sayings, they scarce restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. So Paul had been, the people here thought he was a God. Well, you know the story there. But anyway, the word scarce there means... They just barely did it. They did do, do accomplish it. Now go back to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 18. And use the same understanding and definition of the word scarce. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, that means they did make it. The righteous, they have righteousness of God. They did make it, they did get saved. It says if scarce, if the righteous just scarcely, I mean they just made it in. Then by comparison, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? If Christians just made it, so to speak, scarcely, then how much worse are those that are godly and sinner appear? So it's talking about people, individuals that are saved or not saved, barely saved or look like they're saved or weren't really saved. So I see the context of these three verses. The third verse here was 2 Peter chapter 4. 2 Peter. Oh, wait a minute. Chapter 2. Chapter 2. There you go. Ran out of chapters there, didn't I? <laughs> Second Peter chapter two. We're going to read verse twenty and twenty-one is the reference they wrote here. Second Peter chapter two, verse twenty and twenty-one. Then we're going to back up and read verse eighteen because these verses you need to read in context. Amen. Second Peter chapter two, verse twenty and twenty-one says this: For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge, notice there's the knowledge that people have a knowledge of God and intellectual understanding of God, but, well, let's go on. In the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they, now in verse 20, the word they is used a few times. It's important to know who they are. Who they are. Who's referring to as they? 
For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they, they are again entangled there and overcome in the latter end is worse with them. The latter end is worse with them, they, they, them, than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. In other words, some are worse in their rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ than others are. Those that really don't know anything about things, if they, they're, they're bad, they're still not, that doesn't mean they're saved. But it does mean they're, in a sense, better than those that know all about it and, and more willfully or with more knowledge, they turn from the Lord. See, some know more and they turn from more. Some don't know as much. Now, if you understand the, the they here, it's talking about false prophets. Look at verse 18 now. Let's back up to verse 18 and understand. For when they, there's that they again, same ones used in verse 20, 21. For when they speak, uh, speak great swelling words of vanity, they lure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness. Uh, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. You know, sometimes you find out about some Christian television program or some man or some lady even that fell at, that uh, sin. And you wonder, how did that happen? Well, here it is. They. They. And then verse 19. While they promise them, they the false prophets, promise them people in general liberty, they, the false prophets themselves, are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage. So what these three verses deal with, are those people who's saved, who really isn't saved, how close can it be? How, how deceptive can it be? Uh, can a person show, look like a Christian, act like a Christian, but not really be a Christian? Yeah, yeah. And they can deceive a lot of people, but the interesting verses there, aren't they? Very interesting. All right, next question. <coughs> okay, let's see, I'm gonna move around here a little bit. Okay, this one is, uh, Please explain the difference between the gospel of the kingdom proclaimed before the Lord went to the cross and the word of reconciliation preached by Paul. Uh, we're talking here about the, uh, really two different things though, really in this, this subject. Please explain the difference between the gospel of the kingdom. Gospel means good news and there's good news that God, the Lord Jesus Christ can set up a kingdom in this world. That's good news. That's not the good news of salvation. That's not the gospel of salvation. Gospel of salvation is uh, personal. But this is the gospel of the kingdom. Something else good that God is going to do. But the reconciliation, they're really not connected here. As I understand the, the question, if I understand it right, the word of reconciliation preached by Paul. To be reconciled to God, that's personal salvation. When a person is saved, they are reconciled. Now, the gospel of the kingdom is when Jesus Christ comes back here. That's good news. Jesus Christ is coming back. And he will set up a world kingdom for a thousand years. And that's good news. That's gospel. That's gospel. And then, okay, reconciliation. I think it's a different subject there. Be prepared. Be preached by Paul. Reconciliation. He's a personal individual. The person that's saved. Next question. Is it proper biblical to counsel a female... If you are a male, or the other way around, vice versa. Even the world's organizations recognize it should be men with men and women with women in counseling and training. And they, they must have heard my message this morning. It says here, to avoid danger like avoid landmines. Yeah. Now landmines was the illustration I, I used this morning. So they must have been here this morning, the one that wrote this question, I can tell. All right, is it proper biblical to counsel female if you were a male? No, I don't think so. You know, when I, if I, now, there's a difference between counseling and just talking to someone about some, something they want, some of your advice or thoughts about. Like after Sunday morning church or after Sunday night church, sometimes some lady might say, hey, Pat, let me ask you a question, and they'll ask me certain things. I don't know if you can count that as counseling, but it really is. It really is kind of counseling. But whenever I counsel someone, I never counsel a lady, like, go back in the fellowship room, be here. Uh, yeah. A day during the week or something, go back in the fellowship, just me and her. I'd never ever do that. Right. Never. Right. Uh, if there, it's a lady, Carol's going to be with me. Amen. Yeah. Good. And if Carol's sick or has a hurting back and she's laying at home groaning in pain, she's still going to be with me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but 
no, I don't do that. No, 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 no. That's that's not wise. That's not wise. That's one of those areas you gotta watch out for, pastors. You gotta watch out for false doctrine. You gotta watch out how you handle the money. Money, money, money. You gotta watch that. You gotta watch this situation. Men and women, yeah. So don't ever do that. Don't ever do that. I don't do that. I don't plan on starting ever, ever, ever. So I agree with this person. That is that a dangerous thing? Yeah, that is. I agree with that person. That is a dangerous thing. Don't do that. You know, people can lie about you. And you know, if people lie about you, some people will believe it. Right, right, So watch yourself. Watch yourself, especially as a pastor. Well, Ed, by the way, any Christian for that matter. Okay, next question here. My question is. Oh, oh, okay, it's two sides of this one. Okay, what does many are called but few are chosen mean? The word chosen gets you nervous, not being a Calvinist. No, we're not here. Uh, who does the chosen refer to and how does that work, the chosen? Now, people are chosen to serve. They're not chosen to salvation. You need to understand that. that that's a clear line of things. When the Bible talks about being chosen, I talk about Esau there and others, but that you're not, people aren't chosen to salvation. But once they're saved, they're chosen to serve in some way. Uh, different people have different uh, talents and abilities that God has given them. So chosen here is not used in the Calvinistic sense, no. It's chosen means to, you're chosen to serve in some way. Uh, and you don't always know what that is. I didn't know I was going to be here. Uh, how many years have I been here? 43 years. Uh, pastoring this church. I didn't know I was going to do that. 43 years ago. I just took another step and said, well, maybe I'll start a church in Euclid, Ohio. Look where we ended up. 43 years later. But again, the word chosen is not chosen for salvation. People have their free wills. You need to choose yourself. You need to use that free will that God has given you. Calvinists don't believe in a free will. It's not interesting. So yeah, we're not, definitely not Calvinists, not Calvinists. Remember Roy Thompson, one of his most well-known messages. And he was a guy that used to preach against things a lot. People, people loved it. He was just get kind of that guy. One of his main messages he preached was, uh, let's see if I remember right now, uh, Catholics, Charismatics, and Calvinists. And he was not against, he's not for any of those things. Catholics, Charismatics, and Calvinists. Good message by Brother Roy Thompson years ago. Of course, he's been in heaven now several years already. Okay, another question on the same one here. Why is there a man's, men's prayer time and not the ladies' or women's prayer time? Why not just a prayer time for all of the Lord's children? Well, we have the time together, but, you know, it's good for guys to get together sometimes. Just the men. That's a good thing. So that's one of the reasons for that. Plus, there's only one prayer room in our church. No. There's only one room for prayer. And we can do that. There's ladies who want to have a prayer meeting like at 10 o'clock. Same time the guys are having their prayer meeting. That'd be fine. Uh, talk to me about it, ladies if you're interested. And if there are, certainly that's uh, maybe a good thing. I'd never say no to prayer. Amen. 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 All right. Because again, men and women are different. They have different needs. They pray. They even pray differently in some ways to a degree. But men just need to be together sometimes. They need to be with other Christian men. Kind of share our burdens, share our thoughts, uh, uh, problems even, share our problems. That it's just good for the men to get together, the men, the men. So that's why we have the men's prayer time. We could have a ladies' prayer time. That'd be fine. If ladies want to meet together here at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning, I'd be 100% for that too. Let me know about that. Next question. Oh yeah, it's been several years since BBT, our church, has had a revival meeting. True Christians, uh, up, the person brings this up, interesting. True Christians don't need a, a, a meeting to have a revival. Yeah, amen. You don't really need it, but we should have it every, we should have personal revival every day. It's written down here in the question. However, is having a revival meeting something you would want to have? Yes. Yes, I would. But here's the next part of the question that really clears it up. If so, this is my thoughts exactly here. If so, uh, what would you look for in getting the right, and they've underlined the word right, they're correct, meaning correct, guest preacher or evangelist? You know, there are some around that I like. One of the best ones I like, really, Bob Creel. Pray for him. He still has that polymyalgia rheumatica. I had that a few years ago. 
painful. I got over it in like a few weeks, pretty much. He's had it for, I think, upwards of a year and a half already, if not longer. Painful, painful. Polymyalgia rheumatica. All the muscles in your body hurt. That's what that is. He can't, he's gone to doctors, he's done anything, and he's still hurting from that. But he's one I really would like to have, Bob Creel. He might be number one on my list, and there's some other ones. But when I consider somebody, having somebody here for a revival, be a guest speaker, uh, there's different conditions I want, I want them to uh, preach. I want to make sure they're right on repentance. Yeah, yeah. I want to make sure they're right on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, to have the Lord part down there. You know another good one, Jim Bales. They started a church down there in Southern Ohio. I'm never going to forget Southern Ohio. <laughs> Taking him away from our, our part of the state here. But he's a good, there are other other ones. But when you start to think about, I don't want people attached with this group, and I don't want people that are involved with this other group here. I want to be right doctrinally, I want to be right in repentance, and real salvation, what real salvation is. And then you add all that together that I'd like to have that experience, I'd like them to be a good preacher, or people would come out to want to hear them preach too. So there's a lot of conditions, and there aren't that many around that. Meet the other conditions. I'm glad we have good people in our church, and we'll see how that goes over the years. But to have a revival meeting, I would like to have one. But I'm not going to name any, any different ones that I'm not going to have for different reasons. Uh, but just, that's the reason why. That's the reason why. I would like to have at least maybe like a Sunday through a Wednesday start there. And we can have some time a week long one too. Those are good also. So we'll see. All right, my question is, here's three of them on one page here. Number one, what is the true meaning of forgiveness? A uh, true meaning of forgiveness, of course, as we bring out, it includes, it includes repentance. I forgot to write the reference. It's in Luke chapter 17. I see, I heard that still small voice there. Luke 17, verse number 11. Or somewhere else. <laughs> Luke 17 verse really three that's right that's, I'm getting I always get that mixed up with other ones. there we go Luke chapter 17 verse 3 what's forgiveness forgiveness involves repentance if there's no repentance you don't forgive that's right Gary Gilly he was a good writer in fact a couple of his books are on the, our book table out there Gilly, Gary Gilly he said that while God's love is unwavering and unrelenting it is not uh, unconditional. According to the testimony of Scripture, when it comes to the subject of God's love, there is the unavoidable issue of moral integrity. In the sphere of God's love, evil is neither condoned nor tolerated. Evil is neither condoned nor tolerated. Be careful of this. Towards the end of this little article here, he says, consequently, nearly every manner of evil is tolerated in the name of hypocritical, hypocritical love. Let me repeat that. Consequently, nearly every manner of evil is tolerated. Evil is tolerated. In the name of this hypocritical love, or excused on the basis of a false form of forgiveness. A false form of forgiveness. What is a false form of forgiveness? Forgiveness without repentance. If somebody is going to continue doing what they're doing wrong, you don't forgive them until there's repentance. Then that's repentance. Right, let's look at Luke chapter uh, 17, verse 3 here now. Luke 17, 3. Take heed to yourselves, the Lord says himself. Take heed to yourselves. In other words, be careful here. If thy brother trespass against thee, it was a sin of trespass, rebuke him. Okay, so tell him about it. Now, if he repents, See? If you repent, forgive him. And if you trespass against thee seven times in the day, and seven times in the day, turn again to thee, say, I repent. Yep. People say, well, that's not repentance, it's not in other parts of the Bible where forgiveness is, is used and brought up. That's all right. It's got to have repentance. When you want to find the Bible subject and the truth about some Bible subject, you have to take all the verses that deal with that subject together. Right. Read them all together. Then you get the right picture about things. You don't forgive somebody if they're going to repent, not going to repent. If they're going to keep on doing, doing the wrong things. Uh, you don't forgive them. Right. 
Now, you don't hate them either. That's what people get into trouble. They, 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 they're mad about something that somebody's done to them. So they want to forgive them so they're not angry anymore. Well, that's, that's not the idea. The idea is God will not forgive us if we don't repent of our sins. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. No repentance, no forgiveness. No forgiveness, no salvation. No salvation, no heaven. That's the connection there. So real important, isn't it? Real important. Okay, so forgiveness. Next question, will there be a sermon on, on the meeting the right Christian made? Well, just you do what's right, I would say there. I'll pray about that matter. You do what's right and see if the Lord will provide. Sometimes God doesn't answer all prayers and give all the things we'd like to have. I know that, I know that. Uh, but it's for our right reasons, too. Not every marriage works out wonderfully. Some of the biggest heartaches people have because of broken marriages. So maybe you're being spared from that. You know, if they're, again, I don't know, but the Lord, you have to believe the Lord has your best interest at heart for you all the time. The Lord always has the best interest at heart there. So find a Christian, may pray about that, you have to pray yourself and pray. But if the Lord says no, you know, if not my will but thine, then they won't accept that too. But not everybody's going to be married. Number three, will there be a sermon on the meaning of friendship? I do that once in a while. I haven't very, uh, very recently, but I do preach on friendship. And because really, the Christian life, as you grow spiritually, that's important. As you grow spiritually, you grow in your ability to get along with people. That's one evidence that you're growing spiritually. As you learn to be humble yourself, you learn how to use the right wording when you talk to people. They have a burden for loss, so they have a burden. All those things, as you grow spiritually, you're going to have better personal relationships as you personally grow spiritually. It's connected. All right, next, uh, next question here. My question is, will there be a sermon on how men and women should conduct themselves as ladies and gentlemen in the church? as well as outside the church. Yeah, yeah, I agree on that. We need to handle ourselves well. Yeah. That's one of those circumspectly things. Yeah. Watch yourself. Watch yourself in those areas. Do things the Lord's way. Yeah. Uh, but again, it will be a sermon on that. I, I think I cover that at different times. I don't know if I need to have an actual sermon on that. Maybe, maybe sometime. How to be a man, how to be a... a here it is. How to be a gentleman and how to be a lady. Amen. I've already got the title. <laughs> no, now all I need is eight points underneath that title. <laughs> okay. Will there be a sermon on how men and women should conduct themselves as ladies and gentlemen in the church? Yeah, that's that's a good subject, isn't it? An important subject. Amen. All right, what's next here? What's um, oh yeah, I know where that goes. Okay. I'll put that there. Next question. Oh, Friday Night Church. <laughs> I wonder who did this one. It just says, it. my question is, really not a question, it's a, a blessing. It says, a blessing. Friday Night Church. Come out if you can. Yeah, it's good, I like it. I like it too. I'm glad for a couple, of lots of different reasons, really. There's a lot of good things about it. It's a time of church. That's always good, isn't it? Time of church. It's always good. It's a time for Brother Jeffrey Podolsky and Brother Brown Powell to preach, too. Amen. See, one of the things, because we don't have Sunday school classes right now, I wish we had people uh, that needed the Sunday school class, we'd have them again. Uh, so I feel like I'm not providing a need here. So I think Friday night helps them, too. Gives them a chance to preach. Good. That's good. That gives them experience. Yeah. Uh, that's always a special time, an important thing. So, it gives them an opportunity to preach on Friday nights, and again, it's just twice a month. Remember that. Also, what I'm hoping Friday night, you might invite and attract some people that might not come out Sunday, but they might come out Friday night. I'm hoping it'll be kind of like an outreach, and you have some people coming in on Friday nights that maybe you talk to them, maybe you invite them out to church, and they're hesitant to come out to church and say, well, come out Friday night. It's a little more smaller group. Uh, informal, friendly, or you'll feel welcome there. They teach and preach the Bible too. I'm hoping it'll be a good outreach is what I'm saying. Amen. And people will come into that. And what else? A time, okay, good, good fellowship. 
Even they have the good food there too. Good food there to Friday. So that's twice a month, first and third Fridays of each month, and you're certainly invited to come out to that. All right, next question, yeah. If former President Trump runs as a Republican candidate for president in 2024, do you think he will represent biblical values? Now, I've got some interesting thoughts on this. Does, does Trump read the Bible? No. Does he study the Bible? No. Uh, does he know what, how the Bible applies? No. You know, this is one of those issues where there's different opinion on this. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm back to another point here. Does he go to church? Not much, no. Presidents, president, political rulers, boy, they just, so many of them don't believe the Bible, do they? Now, in some ways, he was better. He, he held the Bible up one time, remember? Boy, did he get a lot of uh, criticism about that. Okay, so, yeah, will he, oh, or will he have a biblical advisor? Is there somebody on his staff that will explain him what the Bible says about these issues? I don't think so. So, anyways, that's interesting, but, uh, yeah, politics. Oh, yeah, yeah. Politics, politics. All right, all right, here's a... I, I said I'd read all the questions, right? And so I will read this one, too. Why is Jeffrey not keeping up with sharpening pencils? <laughs> That's the one. Uh, that, that's the highlight of the night right here. I started ten this morning. Wow, did you really? Oh, oh maybe there was a connection. You got the pen up all that funny. By the way, I sharpened Ben's and put him in there too. And others do it at church also. So not his brother Jeffrey, but that's that was to lighten up the night a little bit there. That's always good. I do have another, what, one more here? Oh, yeah, this one's kind of interesting. I don't know if I'm quite ready for this. I, there's something here I was thinking of reading. Okay, here's the question. Do we have free will in heaven? First of all, once you're in heaven, you're, there's no back doors to leave. And you won't want to, by the way, you won't want to leave heaven. <laughs> Forever and ever and ever. You won't want to leave heaven, no. Do we have free will in heaven? Yes, yes. Well, let me ask you this. We were created in God's image. Now, it, when sin came in, the image was spoiled, was uh, broken, changed, bad, bad. Way. Does God, let me ask you this. Maybe I'll answer it this way. Does God have a free will? Yeah. He chose to do these things. Jesus Christ chose to do the things that he did. God has a free will, and He chose to do these things. He's given us that capacity for free will, too. So I believe we'll have a free will in heaven, but it won't need to be tested anymore. It really won't need to be used, even, in a sense, because we're going to be in heaven rejoicing in heaven. We'll come back with Him for the thousand-year millennial reign with Christ. We'll rule and reign with Jesus Christ. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? We, you and me, Christian, we're going to be in different parts of this world uh, helping the Lord Jesus Christ, telling people what's right and wrong. Amen. I don't know if we're going to be preaching. I don't know about that. It'll be interesting. But does uh, do we have a free will? Have, I think yes. I would answer that yes. Let's see. Here's something I got. It says, the fact that Adam and Eve had a choice to make in the Garden of Eden shows beyond all doubt that mankind was created with a free will. The first couple chose to sin. They chose. Using their free will, they chose to sin. And that choice has plunged the entire world into spiritual darkness, leading to our need of salvation. But friends, we can't blame Adam and Eve. Because I've said this before, and I think you know what I'm about to say here. Because, uh, man, if you were Adam, or I was Adam, and ladies, you were Eve, I or you would do the same thing. Let's see. So you can't blame Adam and Eve. So I'm going to do this best today because not Adam and Eve. No, we would have done the same thing. Because everyone that's born in this world gets a chance to choose too. And which way did we choose? Isn't that free will? So it says they're free, lead to our salvation. Through it all, mankind has retained his free will. 
Is it possible that people in heaven can exercise their free will to sin again? No. And get kicked out of heaven? No, it's not possible. In heaven we will be completely devoid of sin, and our desires will be for the things of God, things that bless us, fulfill us, and give us life. This is true liberty. You know, if we had free will in heaven, I guess I could use this as a kind of explanation or way to explain this. Who would want to leave heaven? Once they're there. If God says, okay, all of you have a chance now to leave him. You can go away. There's only one, by, there's, uh, there's only one other alternative too, by the way. Yeah. Oh. Nobody would. See, God has given to us eternal life. When do we, that's important, when do we get eternal life? We get eternal life when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. When you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, now you have eternal life. You can go to heaven whether you want to or not. You're going to go to heaven. You know what I'm saying. That's a joke too, by the way. You use your free will. Once you have eternal life, it can't be taken away. If it can be taken away, it's not eternal. Amen. You were given only the potential for eternal life. If it can be taken away, you can lose it yet. If you can lose, lose it yet. So, just interesting. Good questions tonight. Good questions. There's one more on, on, let's see. Oh yeah, what is a generation? This is the last question I believe tonight. But what is a generation in Matthew 117? Well, let's turn there, Matthew 117. Like I say, tonight when I my question is always a little different, isn't it? Matthew chapter 1, verse 17. <coughs> The question here again, let me read the question again. In Matthew 1, 17, we see 14 generations mentioned three times. Then here's the question. How many years is a generation? Now this is answered in different ways too. How many years is a generation? The Bible uses the term generation in some different ways. You have to consider the context of where exactly that word is used. Normally, the word generation refers to all people living at the same time. The word in the Bible has the same definition that we are, we, uh, we are used today. Normally, a generation is about 30 years. Kind of interesting. Just, it was just really a few weeks ago, Carol's family, uh, her brother Jim, uh, had a picture taken showing five generations of the Harrisons there. Carol's mom was now 94 years old. Then it's her brother Jim, and his daughter Leah, Leah, that's three generations, and Leah's son was married, and they had a, a baby recently. That's five generations, five generations, still alive, living at the same time. Really interesting, isn't it? So what's a generation? Look at the context. That'll make a little difference there, exactly where, what the context is. And that'll show. But I know what this question is saying too. Because we used to talk, we talked about this when I was first saved even. How many years? Because the Bible says the generation that's alive at certain thing that takes place will be here until, until the Lord comes back. Until Israel becomes a nation again. That was basically it. Now Israel became a nation in 1944. 48, thank you. 48. I like 1944 better because that's my birth year. But 1948, and he hasn't come back yet. But it says in the Bible, until that generation passes away, I'm still alive. And I was born in 44, not 48. So just interesting. It does mean we're getting close, though, friends, isn't it? We're getting close. But exactly what is a generation? It varies in the Bible. Sometimes it can be just 20 or 30 years. Sometimes it's 40 years. So it's different definitions. Sometimes the generation is talking, referring to a certain group of people. Mm -hmm. The generation of Moses or generation of Abraham. Things like that are brought up in the Bible. So you have to kind of look at that and figure it from there. That's a little bit different, a little different here. Yeah, Genesis 2, 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth. When they were created, the day that the Lord God made heaven and earth. So we're living in this generation of this uh, this this time time that we're, we live in six thousand years or so, so this is uh, called the generation two six thousand years. So it's interesting. You have to figure it in its context. You have to write have the right context there. 
So I hope you find it helpful and interesting. People seem to enjoy these nights when we have questions like this. It's a little different, a little different. And let's do like we usually do, have a time of invitation also. So would you, let's pray first and we'll stand up and pray first. Let's pray first. Good. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time tonight. Interesting, a little different, very different from like a regular service. But Lord, I think we've learned some things and it'll help clear up some questions we might have too. And I pray, Lord, that I answer them clearly, certainly biblically. And Lord, if uh, some of the questions I haven't answered that well, I, I pray that you'll show the person that wrote that question. You'll give them the right answers. And, uh, what, if there's more to be added to it or what, Lord, but just help. There were, these are sincere questions, Lord. Thank you for that. Thank you for people that are really interested in the Bible. The Bible makes an eternal difference in people's lives. So I pray we'll believe what the God, what the Lord, what, the, what you say through your word, Lord. In this Bible we have today, still today, because it's preserved. Mm -hmm. Not just 2,000 years ago, not 3,000 years ago, but today it can still be believed. Every single word. Thank you for that. Diminish not a word. I think of that little phrase in the Old Testament. Diminish not a word. When God told him, he said, don't leave even one single word out. Say exactly what I'm saying. Diminish not a word. That's what God told that prophet there. And I pray we'll understand that too. That your word is not a word missing in this Bible. It's not a word missing at all. So Lord, bless now as we have this time. Consider ourselves and, and use this time of prayer, this time of invitation. In Jesus' name, I pray and ask it now. Amen.